We're here in Orlando, Florida at the Siemens Spotlight on Innovation. The concept of a digital twin is becoming increasingly more important in manufacturing. And today we're speaking with Dr. Norbert Gauss of Siemens. He's one of the world's experts on the digital twin concept. Please tell us about your role at Siemens. My name is Norbert Gauss. Uh, I'm with Siemens at Corporate Technology. My responsibility there is all technologies around digitalization and automation. And what does that encompass? That encompasses technology areas like the digital twin, like simulation, like cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, IoT, software systems, all technologies that bring together the, the world of IoT and digitalization. Dr. Gauss, when we talk about a digital twin, please tell us what that is. A simple answer is the digital twin is a, a digital representation of a physical product in all its, its aspects. Now, the last part of the sentence really is the critical one because it means uh, it, it covers the whole life cycle of a product. So it describes the product in designing it, uh, designing it from a mechanical point of view, describing it from embedded software, uh, from a flow mechanics point of view, uh, and, and many, many other aspects, electrical aspects. It also describes, the digital twin also describes how to manufacture the product. It describes how the product behaves during operation and in service and in maintenance. So it covers the whole product life cycle. Why use a digital twin? If we have a digital twin that really represents the physical product in the digital world, then we can, where we want, uh, perform tasks in the digital world, allowing us to do things faster. Uh, for example, simulation instead of timely and costly prototyping. Uh, we can do things much more often uh, until we find the optimal solution. Uh, we will spend less resources, both monetary resources, but also uh, uh, manpower. So the digital twin can be used during all phases of the product development life cycle, the evaluation, and then the ultimate, even the use of that product? Yes, in all phases. It's essentially a simulation then based on the most accurate data that you can possibly pull together. It's a bit more than a simulation. It's a kind of a simulation of many different models instead of just one. And for the purpose, you then pick the ones you really need for this application. Tell us about those models. It typically, the life cycle starts in, in designing a product or in designing a plant. Uh, and this is where you pursue many different avenues. You design products, you, you build CAD models, uh, you simulate those, those CAD models, you, you pick uh, alternatives, uh, you try to optimize, uh, you try to get an idea about the embedded software that has to run on the model. Uh, on, on the physical product, you, you, you model this without really implementing and coding it in, in detail. So you, you simulate in, in all the different aspects. So it's models in the CAD area, uh, it's simulation models for software, it's computational flow dynamics, it's uh, simulating electrical circuits. So it's a, it's a very broad set of models in the design space. Yeah? Then in the next phase of a let me call it life of a product, when it goes into manufacturing, for example, or installation if it's a larger plant, uh, then, then you simulate uh, different things. You simulate or you, you design how to manufacture the product, uh, how well is it built for manufacturability. Uh, that allows you already there in the, in the digital space to build a feedback loop uh, designed for manufacturability by, design, by simulating how it's manufactured. Uh, once you have designed uh, the manufacturing, you can engineer it. You can, for example, automatically feed forward this information and automatically generate PLC code, for example. Yeah? So it's a, it's a feed forward loop and a feedback loop you already have in these two phases. And during the manufacturing process, then you try to, of course, optimize the manufacturing. So all of a sudden you need a pretty accurate model of the manufacturing site itself so that you can optimize this part of, uh, uh, of, the, of the life cycle. The next phase of a life cycle then is the longest one, which is operations. Uh, so in operations, then you also want to optimally uh, operate the system. You want to, for example, uh, optimize 
um, efficiency of a gas turbine or minimize the emissions of a gas turbine. Uh, you want to minimize downtimes of a large motor and so on and so forth. Now, during operation, of course, you need a model that is less complex. Uh, uh, you cannot afford hours of CPU times uh, if you want to make adaptions and optimizations in real time. So you need to reduce the order of the model, uh, significantly reducing the complexity. At the same time, for the critical components you want to optimize, the model has to be still pretty accurate. Uh, so you reduce the order of, of, uh, of the complexity of the model so that you can do inline and real-time, kind of real-time simulation to optimize operations. So. And then there's another important phase, and this is service and maintenance. Yeah? Uh, th these are typically data-driven models. So artificial intelligence, when it comes to predictive maintenance, in a way, is nothing else than a, just another kind of a model driven and defined by data, but it's a model. So this is the last part of the model in, uh, in our life cycle. Uh, important is that, that it's, it's really a combination of a feed-forward loop, where you can automate some of the, uh, of the steps, increasingly more so, and it's also a feedback loop from service into manufacturing, from service into designing the next product generation, from the factory back into design, and so on and so forth. With so many components, how do you ensure that at each step of the, of the process, of the, of the life cycle, that the digital twin is accurately, completely accurately representing the physical object itself and the characteristics and the behavior and the implications that flow from that? As a company, we started this journey 15 years ago, more than 10 years ago, I have to say, uh, and invested a lot to ensure exactly the consistency between the, re the very different representations, to find the hooks and handles uh, between uh, the mechanical design and the flow design, uh, where uh, embedded software comes in and what it does, and so on and so forth, really finding the hooks and handles and implementing them. Another very important component is you know, the, the products we sell, they have a lifetime of, depending on the vertical market, between 10 and 30 years. Uh, now, from the consumer side, we are all used to replace the devices we have in this, in this field every two or three years. Uh, we have to ensure that what we sell from a digital twin perspective is, is still a, accurate rep representation also after 10, 15, and 20 years. Uh, so we really also need to manage the life cycle. We have to be able to update software and represent this in the digital twin. We have to ensure that the as-built digital twin is where the as-built is changing. And you can imagine if you build a larger plant, uh, what is on the, on the drawings uh, in the design, that there will be some changes when we build this large plant, that the changes are being fed back into the plants. So these processes have been established. And, and that has been a major part of our investment. So it's not only bringing the capabilities of defining those models into our company. The big step really then has to be to integrate this as a, as a real toolbox and suite. Can you elaborate more on the role of artificial intelligence in the, the building and the use and the benefit of digital twins? The artificial intelligence is a, is a technology that together with a digital twin, I think, stands out when it comes to digitalization. A digital twin stands out because digitalization means to having a, a digital representation of the physical product. Uh, and, and then it's artificial intelligence because digitalization really is about product, uh, data from products in the fields, in the factory, from, from wherever. Yeah? And then uh, generating value from, from these data. So that's why these two technologies stand out. Uh, they do come together. Uh, actually, they have always come together because remember what I said at the beginning uh, of our discussion, is in, in when, it, when it comes to maintenance, especially predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance, uh, you do build models based on data. 
Now, these are also models and part of the digital twin. So in a way, artificial intelligence actually has always been part of the digital twin. Uh, while I know that for most people, this was a different world, you know, and it was really a separated world. Now it does come together. Uh, it also comes together in, uh, in other areas of the digital twin. We use artificial intelligence for model order reduction is one example. While model order reduction has always been uh, a, a known technology, in, in some cases we need higher complexity, non-linear models where it's very difficult to more or less linearize and, and use the traditional technologies. So we use a neural network to generate a model that pretty accurately uh, represents a motor, for example. That's very interesting. That's so where we do it. So you're using AI to help you create the model that's then used in the digital twin. Exactly. So we feed the network uh, with the very complex designed model, for example, out of NX with, let me say, one million degrees of freedom. We push it through a model to cut it down to maybe 100 degrees of freedom uh, and then make sure that we, from those 100 states, we still would be able to represent, uh, to recalculate the critical states. Uh, so that, that we do with a neural network, with, it, with deep learning, uh, helping us to uh, uh, where we cannot, for example, measure critical states of large motors, uh, simulate this in, in real time and still know uh, how, the, how the motor behaves. We also use artificial intelligence in, in generative design. Uh, now, some ways of generative design is, is not new, but with artificial intelligence, what we try to do, and, and not only mechanical design, also designing electrical circuits is, uh, first we, we widen the design space in which we look. Uh, but if you widen the design space, you get many more design options. Now, typically, all these options have to be simulated, and these simulations are very time consuming. Uh, instead of, so we are not using artificial intelligence to, to simulate, but we use artificial intelligence to pre select options that have the highest chance, for example, in a, in a finite element uh, simulation to converge. So we first widen the design space uh, with artificial intelligence in exploring it. And then we also use AI to reduce the amount of simulations we need, mm -hmm. which I think has huge potential. We do this in a few areas already. And, and I'm, I'm convinced that it uh, really can help us uh, to be much broader. What are the best applications for digital twins, looking at it from the, from the customer perspective? Actually, I don't think there is a best application. You know, I'm, I'm really convinced that digitalization is about the whole life cycle. Uh, uh, depending on the vertical industries, of course, uh, in some of the vertical industries, not in all phases, you really need a digital twin. Uh, uh, some products will all, all, always you know, just work and operate, and you will not need real-time inline simulation. But in essence, Every market, every product owner has to understand that he or she needs a dig some kind of digital representation throughout the whole life cycle to speed up time to market, to reduce cost, to being able to have a much broader portfolio and offering to the market, uh, to uh, use the data that is coming from the field one way or another, from sensors, from service reports, from you know, many data sources. Uh, which today, in, in a lot of cases, are not really being utilized. You know? uh, not really understanding that there's a lot of value in these data. And these, these value needs to be feed back into the, into the future product lines. Uh, again, I don't think there is a priority. There are priorities at the same time. Now, this may sound like a contradiction, depending in which market you are, the majority of your product lines, and so on and so forth. But in terms of a goal, you have to cover the whole product life cycle. What advice do you have for business leaders who are listening to this discussion and saying, yeah, this sounds very interesting, but what should I do? The most critical decision is how to get started on this, this, on, on this journey. Yeah? And uh, there, there is not a blueprint in, you know, in which product, in which life cycle phase uh, a company should start, but it needs a careful analysis of how does, what are the, the dynamics of our markets? Where do we as a company want to differentiate? 
against our competitors. Where do we do differentiate today? Where do we want to differentiate in the, in the future? For what reason? And how can digitalization, which is basically, in essence, a digital twin, really help us? Yeah? And as you define where you want to differentiate, these should be the areas where you get started. When you say differentiate, so the, the, the core components of, say, your, your business, your, 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 yes. your strategy. Yes, yes. You know, we all have competitors in this world, uh, and, and we all need to find the core markets where we want to be a leader and what's important to them. And this is where we need to differentiate or want to differentiate as our product strategy. You know, there's other parts of a, of a corporate strategy, but from a portfolio strategy point of view, and where we want to differentiate on the portfolio. I think this will only be possible by being also leading in the digital part of the portfolio. Fantastic. Dr. Norbert Gauss, thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. <laughs>